Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is Journey to Jupiter, and my guest is Scott Bolton, who is a theoretical and experimental space physicist and associate vice president of Southwest Research Institute's Space Science and Engineering Division, and of course, principal investigator of NASA's Juno Mission to Jupiter. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, this is great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. For sure, for sure. So, you know, um, this, this show is co-curated with our uh, wonderful thought part partner, NASA. And, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, Jupiter, I'm just kind of fascinated. I want to kind of learn and talk a little bit more about it. But first, just kind of Juno. So Juno's this mission. I often write people often in the, especially in the arts world here, it's a NASA mission somewhere. So this is the Juno mission. Can you just kind of help us to understand even just some basic terminology? Sometimes I hear that we sent a probe somewhere. Sometimes I hear that we spent a, sent a spacecraft. Is there actually a technical difference between a spacecraft and or a probe? And which is Juno? And what is the overall purpose of its mission? So starting off with kind of a whole bunch there. So that's a great question. And, and people tend to use those uh, interchangeably when I think uh, many people that are actually working in the space exploration program do have a little bit of a difference. And a spacecraft is basically what Juno is. And of course, it's, it's the kind of thing that goes up and it's powered itself and it's traveling around between places and usually staying in space, orbiting Jupiter, orbiting the Earth, uh, going to different planets. Um, whereas a lot of times the word probe refers to something that goes into the atmosphere uh, of a body. So in 1995, NASA sent a Galileo probe into Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, or sometimes a probe might be a lander on a body. Uh, like we're going to send a, a dragonfly uh, mission to land on, on the moon Titan of Saturn. So sometimes probe really means a lander or a probe that actually measures something directly, uh, goes into the body, um, whereas a spacecraft might be orbiting. They're both making important measurements. Gotcha. Um, Juno's main objective, that was your second yeah. question, is actually to understand Jupiter um, as a giant planet in our solar system. In fact, it's the largest and most massive uh, planet in the entire solar system. It's so big, you could put everything else inside of it. Um, more than half of the leftovers after the sun was born went into Jupiter. And so it represents- and, and Sorry, just to interrupt you there, because you said something that I think some of our audience might not when you said kind of half of the remnants from the sun, could you just quickly kind of just give us a, what happened that, that at, what is that process that actually created our planets and of which the half of those remnants formed this one planet? Well, of course those are, it's a theory, <laughs> but because we weren't around back then, but the idea was is that there was an interstellar cloud into, uh, you know, that was sitting in the galaxy and there are clouds of these materials that have a lot of molecules in them that are floating around and there's a instability of some type in that cloud where you have a gravitational collapse and a star is born. And that's how we think most stars are born. And the material from that cloud is uh, basically reflected in the composition of the star or our sun. Uh, then there's leftovers. So, so there's a disk and there's a bunch of material. The sun is born. Uh, things start to cool. They expand. Ice is formed. Rocks start to form. And maybe the solar system and the planets come out of that and through some other process. And when I say it, it used half the, more than half the leftovers, what I mean is it used more than half the leftovers that went into objects that are in our solar system. A bunch of gas, we think, gets blown away after the solar systems are formed. Mm -hmm. um, and so what Juno's task is, is to try to understand how Jupiter was built, what it's made out of, 
deep inside as well as from the outside and sort of constrain that first step of planetary formation because the belief is, is that because Jupiter is so massive and large that it must have formed first because if the solar system had already existed with all the planets in it, creating Jupiter would have disrupted all of that. So it must have formed first and then everything else kind of all the other planets came later. Gotcha. Fascinating. So, and is there right any, uh, you know, lay people, I think, always wonder with any kind of um, uh, investigation of other planets, is there any components that relate to the possibility of, of any life or origins of life and or uh, does that relate to um, presence of, of, of water or anything like that? Or is that not relevant for Jupiter? No, no, it's very relevant. And in fact, um, Right now, I would say one of the leading places where we might find life is a moon of Jupiter called Europa, and NASA has a mission going there to do that, and I'm, I'm part of that mission. Um, but there's a bigger picture, you know, if you step back a little bit, that Ju Jupiter was so large, and because it formed first, played a role probably in the distribution of volatiles, which include oxygen and water, organics, all of the things that we think are the elements of life. It governed that distribution of those throughout the early solar system. So in some ways, many scientists believe that you wouldn't have Earth the way it is without Jupiter. Maybe we wouldn't have gotten the elements that were needed to start life. Um, now, whether there's life on Jupiter itself, that's, uh, that's a hard question to answer. We aren't tasked with discovering that or even researching to see if Jupiter could have life. But there was a, a paper by Carl Sagan many years ago that tried to think outside the box, which of course is the key to innovation and you know using your creativity. And he, he basically put together a paper that imagined that life could be floating around in Jupiter's atmosphere. In fact, he called them floaters and it's possible. Uh, normally, we, we're a little bit egocentric and we think of life like us or, we, or like it is on the earth, but it doesn't have to be. You got to, you know, take an open mind and consider it any way. So Jupiter could, any, right. any planet, uh, life, could, life in our oceans doesn't look much like us. Right, right. And so, and so this is all really fascinating. You mentioned Carl Sagan and kind of previous thoughts about Jupiter. Have there been previous missions to Jupiter? And if so, is, is, is Juno kind of a significant step forward? Is it unique, more unique than the previous missions there? Uh, well, Jupiter, Juno represents the next step, you know, be after the last mission. So there's definitely been previous missions. It's, uh, we started with Pioneer a long time ago where we just flew by. Voyager flew by with two different spacecraft. We learned a lot. Um, and then in, in 1989, NASA launched uh, the Galileo mission, which had a probe to go into the atmosphere. Also, uh, aiming at learning how much water was inside Jupiter because it would tell us about how Jupiter formed. Um, that probe came back with puzzling answers and we didn't understand it. And, you know, sometimes missions end up providing more questions than answers. And the Galileo probe might have been in that category. So Juno was designed to follow that up along with many other questions that came from previous missions and studies. And so we're, we are taking a very significant, unique step. One, we're a polar orbiter. So for the first time you saw the poles of Jupiter, so you looked at it as a whole body. The second is, as we went in and we're looking at the inside deep structure of Jupiter, three different ways that were not really possible with previous missions, partly because we're orbiting really close and partly because we have new kinds of instrumentation that look inside beneath the clouds. Uh -huh, gotcha. So all of this, right, this is going to be just extraordinary volume of data, of, of information that's going to come back. So for, you know, people are often, you know, uh, who may not be as, as, as kind of mystified and inspired um, by, by space and, and other planets as, as certainly I am, uh, they might say, so, so where's the connection? So how does this knowledge kind of help us? What, what would be kind of your response to, to those who would say, okay, so how will this data, how do we think this will help us or move us forward or advance us as a society? 
So, uh, I mean, the question goes back to really fundamental ideas and, and uh, sort of curiosities of humanity. I mean, I think everybody experiences this when you're, especially when you're young. Later in life, you get busy with paying the bills and making things work in your life. And you might set aside the questions that you can't always understand or know the answers to. But, um, you know, what we're doing is trying to answer really basic questions like who we are, are we alone? How do we get here? Uh, where are we going? And um, all of NASA's programs are sort of along those lines, but Juno is special in the sense that we're looking at that first step in the solar system. And if we can understand how Jupiter was born, you're kind of understanding the recipe of how we came about. How do a solar system get made? What is there something special about us? Uh, you know, we're seeing other planets now around other stars. The question is, is, you know, is there something special about us that we're alone? Most scientists would say no. So we sort of want to understand how common are we? What are the, what, did you need a giant planet like Jupiter to get an Earth and life? Uh, maybe, maybe not. So part of looking at, at Jupiter and understanding its origin and, uh, and its formation and evolution helps us understand that. Um, and as far as inspiration, I mean, that is one way, but we also have another way with, with Juno, and that is that we take all the images, and Jupiter has turned out to be like a, an artist's palette, right? I mean, it's unbelievably gorgeous, and you can see that in the Juno images. I mean, they look like Van Gogh paintings, and we put those on a website as raw data, and we have citizen scientists all over the world, artists, engineers, you know, every walk of life, including scientists that can go in and make their own images. And we're finding that um, people are inspired. Some are trying to do some science with it. And in fact, we've included them in our science publications. And some of them are just expressing themselves and doing art, which is great because they're linked. Exactly, which I think is so amazing. And the public access to this, the, these visuals and to this data, I think is so, so important and so empowering. Um, so, you know, if you will, it seems that all things seem to come to an end. So at some point, the Juno mission will come to an end. When will that be? And, and has that changed? Um, and what will happen? So um, the original plan for Juno was to go around Jupiter 32 times to collect science. We had two spares, so it made like 34 orbits around Jupiter. That was completed July 31st of 2021, this summer. And um, back in uh, last year, we wrote a proposal at NASA's invitation to look at an extended mission. And we now started that on August 1st. It was approved, works into the extended mission. And that's approved through um, the end of, uh, so, uh, let's see, the September 2025. So we get a whole bunch more orbits. And what's unique about it, besides uh, continuing the understanding and or investigation and, and improving our understanding of Jupiter and looking at discoveries that we made, we're actually going to go look close at the satellites and the rings, and we're going to do new kinds of things that weren't possible in the original mission, mainly because our orbit is changing because Jupiter's so big, we can't control it. It twists us around and it's throwing us so that we go really close to the satellites, which is a great that, benefit. Fascinating, truly fascinating. Really quick, just follow up to that. So, so to be able to extend, a lot of times people think, okay, well, we're just gonna extend something for another you know, four years. Um, how is uh, Juno powered? So Juno's powered with solar arrays. We're the first solar powered mission to go out as far as Jupiter. There are now a couple of them planned. Um, I like to say we were, we were green before it was in to be green. Um, uh, so we're powered and, and so those solar arrays could degrade, but at the moment they're really performing great. And um, the other two things that might uh, cause or, or impact how long the mission lasts, um, is the uh, availability of fuel, because we have fuel on board that turns the spacecraft. It's not so much changes our orbit, although we can do a little bit of changing. It mainly allows us to point the antenna at the Earth, which allows us to communicate. And if we lost that ability, then you would be there working, but you wouldn't be able to send any data back. Gotcha. Um, and the other is radiation. 
Jupiter's a really harsh place. It's the monster in the solar system. And if you get close to it, and we are close, you get a lot of radiation, which kills the electronics. And um, we're shielded like an armored tank, though, and the shields are holding so far. Gotcha, gotcha. And then when things are all over, what happens to Juno? Um, well, the original plan was that we would go into Jupiter at the end in order to make sure that we don't accidentally crash into one of Jupiter's moons that we want to study, you know, and potentially contaminate it. However, um, in this extended mission, after next year, we will pass by uh, Europa, which is the really high priority moon, and it would be really impossible to go crash into it. And so what we're studying and, and sort of uh, on the way to getting approval of is, is that at the very end, you would just let Juno keep going around until it didn't work. You wouldn't have to do anything special. Eventually, it will crash into Jupiter whether we cause that crash on purpose by directing it, or if we just nature, let nature take its course. Gotcha. And when it crashes into Jupiter, it will burn up. Gotcha, truly, truly fascinating. Well, unfortunately we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask my guests, um, you know, since we're at the intersection here of arts and sciences, do you have either an arts discipline or practice that you like to do or that you really love observing? Uh, actually both. Um, I love just going to museums and, and looking at things, but my whole life I've been involved in different kinds of art uh, from music uh, all the way through painting, drawing, sculpture. So um, I'm heavily vested in, in both the arts and the sciences. Um, my profession is the science and my hobby is the arts, but I try to blend them together as much as possible. Um, because I think that's how you, uh, that's the key to creativity is using both sides of your brain as much as possible. And, um, and if I don't have the, the right enough art in me, then I make friends with artists and uh, start mixing them in with my world. Truly, truly awesome. Scott Bolton, thank you for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thank you. It was great talking with you.